SR71 Blackbird story. Apparently, this plane was invulnerable. I'm excited to check this one out, see what we got with this. Before we do, a lot of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. If you're one of those people that aren't subscribed, I appreciate if you can hit that subscribe button down below. But yeah, let's check out the SR71. I've never seen In the midst of the Cold this. War, two MiG-25s race to intercept the threat along the Soviet border. They're the fastest interceptors ever built, and if they really push their engines, they can reach an incredible Mach 3.2. What's but that? It's not enough because what they're chasing. Wait, what's equivalent like miles per hour Mach 3.2? What is that? With? Can outrun and outclimb any threat. A plane engineered to be invulnerable. Okay. Was this like the fastest plane ever? The Cold War locked the United States and Soviet Union into a tense struggle for global influence and control. Both sides poured enormous resources wow. into military technologies. But getting an upper hand means knowing your opponent's next move. Uh, and in the 1950s, little was known about facilities deep within the Soviet Union. And it's Yo, it's actually crazy how much of like, because obviously so many EU countries are in here, right? It's actually crazy back then how big the Soviet Union was. Like the amount of EU countries that are here now. Extensive network of radar stations, surface to air missile sites and interceptor air bases kept the Americans away. Until 1956, when U-2 spy planes began flying over the Soviet Union. Neither fast nor stealthy, U-2s had one critical advantage. Oh wait, I don't think, now that we zoomed out, I don't think they're actually EU countries. Actually, some of them might be, I'm not sure. At 70,000 feet, they could fly above Soviet air defenses. US President Eisenhower was even assured Soviet radars couldn't detect the U-2 at such high altitudes. Uh. But it turns out the Americans were wrong. The Soviets had tracked the U-2 since day one, and it was only a matter of time before they'd be able to shoot one down. Uh -oh. Simply flying high wasn't enough. Even before the U-2 began its surveillance missions, there were already plans underway to replace it. Because true impunity over Soviet airspace would need a combination of incredible speed, altitude, right. and stealth. And this led the Americans to explore some pretty radical spy plane concepts, like a ramjet-powered aircraft that would be deployed from the bottom of a supersonic B-58. But in 1959, the CIA chose Lockheed to develop the next generation of spy plane. Meanwhile, the U-2 continued to fly over the Soviet Union, but not for very long. Because in the spring of 1960, a Soviet surface-to-air missile finally managed to bring one down. Damn. The captured pilot and wreckage were paraded around the Soviet Union, used as proof of Western aggression. As tensions rose, now more than ever, the U.S. needed a replacement for the U-2. Right. Bro, I ain't gonna lie, man. This looks badass. This is the SR-71, right? This is badass, bro. This and what Lockheed like... developed would be unlike any aircraft ever built. A plane that nearly 60 years after its first flight remains the fastest air-breathing jet to ever fly. Still? Aye, so it is the fastest jet. And you're telling me after 60 years this is still the fastest? Yo, it ain't no way, bro. Lockheed's highly classified spy plane would be known as the A-12. Right. Originally used by the CIA for reconnaissance, the A-12 was also developed into an interceptor prototype armed with air-to-air -air missiles, along with a variant uh. that could launch an unmanned reconnaissance drone. But it was the SR-71 Blackbird, a variant developed for the Air Force, that would go on to serve for decades, while earlier versions were quickly retired. The Blackbird could cruise at Mach 3.2, right near the edge of space, and do it for hours on end. Wow. To achieve this, Lockheed's engineers had to innovate pretty much everything from scratch. To sustain such incredible speeds, the SR-71 and its predecessors I can't lie, this might be one of my favorite looking jets. I ain't gonna lie, I'm looking at this right now and I would actually love like, <laughs> I, I love like, you know, kind of like those Lego sets you get. I got one behind me, you know, Darth Vader head right there. Bro, it'd be really cool to like make one of these with Lego. We're powered by well, even just like a small version. Speeds, the SR-71 and its predecessors were powered by engines often described as turbo ramjets. Below Mach 2, they functioned like conventional after burning jet engines. 
But above that, they behaved more like ramjets, as an inlet cone adjusted to bypass air around the engine and directly into the afterburner. I that right there was a lot. If you don't understand jet engineering, <laughs> the, all, all, all you make. <laughs> Ooh, that was <laughs> I have no way you just that you guys gonna have to like explain it more in simpler terms to me in the comments so I can like you know get the gist of this all I know it goes really 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 quick right and before so before so speed the edges do some type you know they're moving some type of way and then when they go quicker they activate the uh the beast mode at Mach 3.2, the SR-71's exterior would heat up to beyond 500 degrees Fahrenheit. What? Easily hot enough to soften aircraft aluminum. The Lockheed engineers used titanium for 92% of the aircraft. All right. And in the 1960s, this required inventing entirely new fabrication technologies. Its unusual shape did more than just spook UFO enthusiasts. It helped. That's what I was saying. It looks alien like. Bro, I ain't surprised people thought there was UFOs flying around everywhere. This was it. it reduced its radar signature, as did its special black paint oh, enthusiasts. It helped reduce its radar signature, okay. as did its special black paint, which earned the SR 71 its Blackbird name. It's really cool looking, I ain't gonna lie. The A-12 and SR-71 were first deployed over North Korea and Vietnam, where they were unsuccessfully targeted by over 800 surface-to-air missiles. Uh, that's good. But the spy plane never flew into Soviet airspace, at least not officially, because another shootdown over the Soviet Union would be catastrophic. So instead, the SR-71 flew along its borders, using its powerful side-looking radars and cameras to peer hundreds of miles into Soviet territory. Wow, we could that do that? frustrated the Soviets. You're telling me it could just fly along the border and still would look... Bro, what? In 1976, Viktor Belenko defected to the West by escaping the Soviet Union in his MiG-25. He described the frustration of trying to intercept Blackbirds. The MiGs were Mach 3 capable, but only for a few minutes at a time, not for hours like the Blackbird. Nor could they climb to reach the SR-71's incredible altitude. Mad. Even their enormous R-40 missiles lack the guidance needed to strike the SR-71 head-on. So you, you, you just can't for catch years, it. the Blackbirds were practically invulnerable. Yeah, you can't they get it. outfly and outclimb any threat. But by the 1980s, MiG-31s were roaming the skies. Equipped with sophisticated radar and long-range R-33 missiles, they uh -huh. posed a legitimate threat, as did a new generation of Soviet surface-to-air missiles. But the greatest threat to the Blackbird wasn't an enemy missile or jet, it was itself. No Blackbird was ever lost on a mission, but more than a third of the 50 built were destroyed in accidents. Huh? One literally disintegrated around its pilots. What? What is that? Because it got so hot, it like melted. It, what? They were also enormously expensive to How? operate. Each one siphoning about three hundred million dollars a year out of America's defense budget. Wait, how is it? Wait, three hundred million dollars a year just for one? What maintaining? Oh, bro, how? Like, what is going on? Bro, that's getting the craziest polish of all time. A fleet of special aerial refuelers and a small army of support and maintenance staff were needed just to keep these planes mission ready. And advances in spy satellites, aerial drones, and the SR-71's inability to deliver surveillance data in real time diminished some of the plane's utility. Oh, yeah. Add to that politics and infighting for defense budgets, and by the late 1980s, the SR-71's days were numbered. They were officially retired in 1998, with uh. two sent to NASA for testing. Wait, 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 wait. In 1998, with two sent to NASA for testing. Testing for what? Wait, I got, I, meet, meet Bob. Meet Bob, he's from NASA. Hey, hey, Bob, the SR-71, why did you guys test them before, huh? He refused to speak. Okay, interesting. The technology behind the A-12 and SR-71 is now well over 50 years old. Yet somehow these incredible planes still speak to us. Not about the past, 
but the future, leaving us with a sense of wonder, unlike any other in aviation history. I'm wondering why that was built like 60 years ago and it's that fast, that good. How would they not build something faster and better? Do you know what I'm saying? Or have they? If they have, let me know in the comment section. That plane is absolutely badass. In the video, they said it was still the fastest. But let me know if there's a plane faster now. It'll be interesting to check that one out. But yeah, really cool plane, really cool looking. Yeah, surprised about some of the stuff that they were saying in that, especially with like 300 million to maintain it a year. It's crazy. But yeah, really good video. Enjoy that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed as well let me know what you guys think in the comment section if you guys did enjoy make sure you thumbs up subscribe for more content i'm live every single day on twitch.tv forward slash alfred if you guys want to check me out over there i'll see you on the next one peace